every single person who achieved a level of success not by luck but by commitment and deliberate effort to achieve that goal will tell you about books that they have read that changed their life. It doesn't matter. You can be a soccer player, an entrepreneur, a high-level executive, or a doctor. Anyone who has had to fight for their success will tell you that in the search for the right path, they have gone through so many books and several other books have actually changed their life. And for me, in this video, I will share with you guys five books that changed a course of my life immediately after I read them. You know, the very interesting thing about books is this. There are so many books out there talking about different kind of topics and not that many of them will hit you. And the reason is for you to actually feel an impact of a book. It's not about how good necessarily the book is, but when you also read it matters. And I've read several books, but I am the first one to admit that I used to read all the wrong books at least wrong for the things that I was trying to achieve. And it was when I read the book that changed the course of my life, then I realized that, okay, this is what I was missing. Because sometimes it's that little piece of inf information that you need to navigate into the next phase of your life. So what you read matters. It's not just about volume. So let's get into it. My life and at what point did I read it? Because it will make sense. Let's get to it. Book number five, The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. So I hear about a lot of people talk about The Rich Dad, Poor Dad as their first book that definitely gave them the it moment to start being disciplined about money or at least start to go for the money to accumulate wealth and grow whatever the little they have or to build a business, right? That's the book that inspired a lot of people. For me, it was the four hour work week. I had read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and The Worthiest Man in Babylon, but those books for me felt a little bit out of touch. I was already in the digital economy and the four hour work week definitely was talking about things that were happening in front of me using the internet, leverage, building small businesses and travel at the same time. It was basically talking about the digital nomad idea before the digital nomad was even in the mouths of so many people at the time. So when I read it, it was very realistic. It even gave you the websites and the platforms that you need to use to get certain things done. And that is when I started really my digital empire started building content and so many other things and also understanding that what's more important is actually not the money the time is the end goal because when you start making money you realize that you get consumed by the process of making money so the four hour work week taught me how to develop processes that i could be able to run multiple things at once without getting too consumed by them so if you want to make money in the modern er in the modern age, I would definitely recommend that you check out the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. Book number four, Zero to One by Peter Thiel. So Peter Thiel is already one of my favorite philosophers of our time. Very smart. He has built several companies, including PayPal, and he was an early investor in Facebook. And he has been a critique of the modern life when it comes to how technologies are evolving. He's a billionaire, obviously, right? But Peter had taken several steps in his life that are very, can be considered eccentric by so many people. He is a contrarian. He is known for being a, con a contrarian. And this was a very contrarian view of the world on a lot of other things. And for someone who is in the digital economy and also very interested in startups and building businesses, he made me to start looking at edges in everything. The idea behind the book basically is the concept of a secret that the best things in life are based on secret, whether in business, it's all about something that you intrinsically know to be true. To you, it's so obvious, but to everyone else, believe that it's wrong. Let me give you an example. Before Uber was born, an idea of a stranger requesting an Uber, an app, a, a taxi on their phone, and then this taxi would be another person who is also an independent person just driving his own car, and that stranger would come to your house to pick you up, drop you to where you need to go, and then the transaction is done everybody would make money the independent driver and the taxi rider and the app itself is a third party that is just conducting the transaction between the rider and the driver obviously you would have gone nuts that this is not going to be possible or the idea of Bitcoin is something that Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator, was so convinced that this is something that has to be out in the world. But obviously, the average person at the time if told that, look, you can create a currency that is not controlled by government and trillions of dollars 
can be traded on top of it you know, as an independent network. Things like that scale really well and they're more likely to be successful because you make people see something for the first time from a different perspective, but because it's true, they will believe it. And it gave me confidence in my own ideas, even when first with doubt by, uh, by other people. Other people may doubt your ideas, but if you're convinced and your view of the world is based on first world principles and truth, you should pursue it. Eventually, people will catch up and they'll understand. And it's exactly how I felt when I got involved in Bitcoin. Nobody around me actually could see value in it if it's a really important thing at all. But it turned out that my intuition about it was right. And now it's the thing that has been responsible for creating the life that I have today, building businesses and making so much money from it. So Zero to One by, Be by Peter Thiel, very short book, highly, highly, highly recommended. Book number three, The Inserto. So The Inserto is not necessarily one book. It's a collection of books by a fellow called Nassim Nicholas Taleb. He blocked me on Twitter, but he's still my favorite author out there and thinker of our time. And you would note that I actually like to read books by people that are living today as opposed to so many older philosophical stuff, but we'll get to that later. But The Insero is composed of The Black Swan, Food by Randomness, Skin in the Game, The Bed of Procastus, and I forgot what the fifth one is. I think right now it's just four of these books. But this guy is a probabilist and he looks at the world from a probabilistic point of view and he makes an argument that the world basically is fooled by randomness. That's why we're faced by situations like black swans and black swans are things that should be accounted for because they happen all the time. And we will never be really risk averse or analytical enough about life because much of it is actually random. And rationality needs to be questioned as well because it's very difficult to know what's rational and what's not. And also he talks about in skin in the game that systems fail if you create incentives that basically does not cost the doer or the active participant in the risk. You need to take risk to be able to gain rewards. And if you're developing a system, it can be your personal life system, it can be your own company as a person or how you handle your family, or basically as a frame of how you see the world. You should not be trusting someone who has no risk in the activity, which means the skin in the game. And he argues that in a better system, anybody who is participating can benefit from the proceeds or the rewards of the activity, but also they should be still exposed. They are exposed to the downside of X activity, what's going on at the time. A good example of this is driving. You don't drive nicely because you're a nice person. Even an asshole is a good driver simply because if he makes a mistake on the road to kill someone and kill someone, he is also go more likely going to die. It's very difficult for you to cause an accident that will kill someone and guarantees your own life to be 100% safe. So that is a robust system. That means that you should be desi designing your life based on on principles like that. If you expose yourself to the risk, you should expose yourself to the rewards and the downside if things go wrong. And governments don't work really nicely these days or governance is a problem in modern life simply because of a poor design of the system where a minister, a president can make a mistake, steal a lot of money. If something goes wrong, they basically don't, they just lose their job, but they don't lose the funds that they steal from the community. Anyway, long story short, you should read the insert of all these books, guys. It's a good fun read. You will enjoy them. And of course, all the books that I talk about here are available on Audible. You can simply just listen to them. I'll put the link to Audible. Sign up with my link. It will be in the description. Book number two, The Code of the Samurai. So I heard of The Code of a Samurai, the book from my mentor at the time and it was at, at a time where i was struggling with scaling and discipline you know it's one thing when you used to do something on your own and i was very successful at that just doing everything on my own no problem the moment you start adding other people to the equation whether it's a pa or your team or family things become a little bit difficult. However, as you scale as an entrepreneur, as a business person, you need to start making long-term decisions, which means investing in people, and you also need to put trust in other people. However, for you to create the culture that is responsible for that, you need to know or understand how humans work in terms of principle. A lot of people think that the way Japan is, that the Japanese are so clean, respectful, elegant, and very polite. They think that that is by accident 
accident, but it's not. It's all based in the Bushido code. Right now, the Bushido code is still implemented in Japan uh, in multiple levels of their governance and culture. That's why they are, they are the way they are. So it's basically the codes of the warrior. And if you think of yourself as a warrior, which you are, if you're gonna go out there in the world to fight wars and make money, it's not going to be easy, right? The world is a very hard place. You need a code of, of ethics, a code of conduct, a mission statement, and the approach to life and the appeal that you need to have in life to deal with all the hardships. The Bushido code covers everything. How you're supposed to dress, how you're supposed to think about family, how you're supposed to think about people that work for you, how you're supposed to handle conflict, how you're supposed to handle your, your relationship. Everything that you can think or you might think as a modern thing is discussed. Even how corruption is created and how you can eliminate it in what you're doing is in the Bushido code. You know, this ancient knowledge can be so relevant and so in touch because you know I grew up in a very in a religious family and to be honest a lot of the religious text doesn't sit well with me in a way that I, I struggle to connect with it. But when I read the Bushido Code, in some ways it felt like religious text, but that was actionable and it was in touch with what's going on in the world today. So the Code of the Samurai, I definitely recommend it. Incredible book. It changed how I look at things. For example, let me, let me share with you something that I learned from the Bushido Code. Every time I see a young man, a guy who is dressed, let's say on the flight when I'm traveling, it happens a lot someone their pants are under their waist and they're wearing these sliders some designer sliders and some fancy glasses or whatever right it happens in a lot of instances where it shouldn't happen the whole point is that you as a man you're supposed to be dressed up for combat at all times you're ready it taught me to be dressed always in combat pants or combat shorts as a man with multiple pockets around me where I can be able to keep several things or whether it's weaponry or tools that you need for the day to dress up nicely with my pants above my waist tight properly strong shoes and with clean clothes something that must represent must make you feel that you're on duty there's a reason why soldiers dress the way they they dress it's part of discipline but also it's for functionality so when you're just dressing up in some tight pants that you can't even walk around properly some big designer shoes yes but they're just like designed in a way that makes you dysfunctional that is not being combat ready that's not war ready and it makes you vulnerable in the fight or in the war of accumulating assets because at the end of the day just making money is basically a war you are fighting for resources you have to be ready you have to be groomed re really well for the fight and to simplify that point the bushido code says that in the times of peace men relax they even tell their masters their overlords that this time you should not worry so much about getting combat ready because we have no threats but when times come that they should now react to the hardships of the world they frail because they're not ready so next time you're wearing your pants under your waist and some crazy shoes that makes it dysfunctional for you to run or the pants are too tight that you can't even throw a flying kick, you should remind yourself that you are not being combat ready. If you can't run because of what you're wearing as a man, that is a problem. You're not living according to the Bushido code. There's a reason why samurai dressed the way they were dressing is to be combat ready ready at all times book number one and this is really really dark this is the alchemy of finance by george soros now george soros is one of the most hated men in the world today for some reason i don't understand it but people who have never read his work basically hate the man they make him responsible for all the ills of the world but george soros read an incredible book and he demonstrated this concept of reflexivity the concept of reflexivity is i would say responsible for my financial success so far from God from absolute nothing, zero, being dirt poor to making some money, I think I have implemented most of the reflexivity theory. Basically, what it says is the relationship between you, the world, and thinking, and the thinking participants. For example, when you say something like, people are like this and this and that, you comment about a certain aspect or characteristics of humanity, right? You look at the world as you on one side, you're here, and the rest of the world is over there. You are separate, you are separating yourself from those people. However, 
you are actually exactly the same as those people. You are part of the people, so you cannot, it's very difficult to distinguish the human activity and its results and the participants because you are also part of the participants. So for everything that humanity does, you might say that, oh, look, these people, man, people are like this and that. It's like, oh, you're actually part of those people. In some ways, you cause that effect. Now, it's about understanding that gap between humanity, what they do, and what they think what's going on on the ground and what's in the minds of people. If you understand that relationship, you can now exploit that region and that's how you can actually make money even in financial market if you can do it effectively. And that is the concept of reflexivity. It's those, it's, it's that relationship between reality and the participant thinking as George Soros puts it. So I definitely recommend it. It can be quite dark for some people, but honestly, I think it's a very good book. It will teach you a lot more about humanity and what you should think about it. An extension about this book is everything that Karl Popper has wrote because George Soros is was influenced by Karl Popper. So Popa has written a bunch of books, including the open, the open Society and Its Enemies. I've read that book that, that I quite enjoyed, but I think George Soros basically outlines this concept really well, especially when it comes to making money. I think The Alchemy of Finance is the book that you guys should read as well. Thank you for watching. I hope you read these books and you let me know what you think about them. And if you have other books that you would like to recommend for me to read, I would definitely appreciate it. Drop a comment below and like this video so that we can defeat the YouTube algorithm. For every like I get, I will do one push-up for every single like. So I appreciate all the likes and subscribe to this channel if you appreciate the knowledge that will help you to do well in your life. And also do not forget if you want to learn how to make money in the modern economy through artificial intelligence, cryptocurrency, NFTs, content, something that I know really well and I implement in my life each and every day, go to CryptoUniversity.network and grab some of the courses there that you like. I created those courses to help you guys to do well in your life. If you take my courses and you don't do well in life, I will be happy to give you a refund. All right, I'll see you guys in the next video. Stay awesome.